Today's video is brought to you by one of the best applications I've ever used, Audible. If you are looking for inspiration for your next campaign or epic character like Brizit the Drow Ranger, Audible is the answer. With an incredible catalog of fantasy audiobooks, you will never run out of ideas to make your next game the best experience for your party. Because you are the best fans we could ever ask for, we have an exclusive offer where you get any of their amazing audiobooks and a 30-day Audible trial for free. And what? More? You also get two Audible Originals for free. Free stuff is awesome. All you need to do is visit audible.com slash allthingsdnd or text allthingsdnd to 500-500 and boom, you've hit the jackpot. For anyone wondering where to begin your epic fantasy audio journey, we won't keep you guessing. We strongly recommend you start with Homeland by R.A. Salvatore. It's easily one of the best fantasy series of all time and is the standard for fantasy set in the Forgotten Realms. Start listening right now. Seriously, you'll love it. I listen to all 10 Malazan audiobooks using my free rolling credits. Now I'm running a campaign based on that series and my players are loving every second of it. Audible members can choose three titles every month, one audiobook and two Audible originals you can't hear anywhere else. You're guaranteed to find something you enjoy. And on top of all of that, your audiobooks stay with you even after you cancel your Audible membership. Just sign up and get that first audiobook and venture forth on an epic fantasy audio journey, anytime, anywhere. The veteran necromancer teaches the greedy party a bloody and valuable lesson. Currently in a 3.5 campaign, my DM is a pretty great one, but the current cast of players leaves something to be desired. All are either first timers or folks who have only ever played 4e, so there is some system shock to get over. The DM confides in me that I can make whatever build I want, since she will be protecting the newbies and throwing reasonably hard encounters at me. So I decided to make a necromancer, specifically a hyper durable, impossible to kill necromancer that will enable me to survive any insane crap the party in its folly drags me into. I decided to specialize in rays so that I can hang in the background and let the new players enjoy the spotlight. I make judicious use of spells like Ray of Enfeeblement and Clumsiness, which allows me to debuff like a boss and help the rest of the party shine. I slowly grow in power, hoarding as much magic as I can. The campaign progresses and the other folks who initially created unique Snowflake Mary Sue characters are actually starting to work as a team, providing support for each other's abilities and tackling things with something akin to competence. And then they got greedy. It was a relatively hard fight ending with a rather masterful round of combat from our cleric, who murdered several high-level combatants and their undead minions with a greatsword and a nasty combination of touch spells. The party is dividing the loot and claiming bits of choice treasure when finally the pixie scion turns to my quiet, unassuming human necromancer and demands a slice of my loot, saying that I did nothing during the struggle to take the tower, so I didn't deserve a full share. Now mind you, I had been reliably performing my job as party troubleshooter and general helper. I stripped away the arcane protection of the crazed mage in the basement, I had gotten us through several traps of arcane nature, used huge amounts of combat control magic during our struggle to the top level, and, in the final struggle, I had turned the rather impressive stat lines of the leaders into something you would expect from a first level gnome commoner. Needless to say, I was less in game for losing the small mountain of coins, scrolls and gems that my labors had earned me. After I politely refused to hand over the loot, the scion threatened me with force. A quick intervention by the NPC guide who led us there averted anything serious, but I knew that my time with this group had finally come to an end. Our characters split up, vowing to all assemble the following day to ensure the handoff of the tower to our generous employer and to agree on loot distribution. The following morning, we all assembled in the entryway of the tower to show our boss what we had claimed for him. After around 10 minutes of real-time haggling, we received roughly 60% more than we had originally been promised and now we were looking at a pretty sizable chunk of cash. In fact, if all those gold pieces had been melted down, they could have formed a mass the size of a rather large sedan. I had hoped that this would slake the greed of the party, but now the rogue and sorcerer had sided with the pixie and were insisting that I should only be awarded a cut of the payment from our employer, and not a share of the swag we acquired when storming the tower itself. After again refusing, the pixie, in what I am sure she thought was a stroke of brilliance, said that we could all work it out the next day since we had to remain to guard the tower until the merchant's guards and mercenaries arrived to take over stewardship. Spotting the obvious trap, I reasoned that this might actually be the best way for me to survive the inevitable assassination attempt. 
The rest of the party knew that I had a small sanctum somewhere, just six or seven rooms underneath a tavern, in a small city, that were so heavily warded with magic and traps that a demigod couldn't have entered if I hadn't wanted him to. Naturally, I had to put up a little fight, until finally letting the pixie's words sway me into staying. I took a small cloistered bedroom near the top floor as my own and retired early. To sell the illusion of my death, I knew that I would need to make it believable to the party. My plan was to let them assassinate me and then catch them talking about it to ensure that no one would complain that I metagamed it. Then I would unleash my fury, and it would be truly monstrous to behold. For a start, I warded the room with several castings of alarm, the door, the window, etc. Arcane lock on the door, fire trap on the lock itself, and then several castings of icicle, an explosive runes or two, and a sepia snake sigil on my fake spellbook. These magics were relatively low-powered, as I wanted their assassination attempt to succeed, but I needed to give them the impression that I was cautious. The key to the plan was casting clone, several heightened illusions, and rope trick. When all things were ready, I popped off into my extra-dimensional space and hoped that the party would fall for my plan, as within my pocket dimension, I would be unable to affect the world I was leaving behind. So I crossed my fingers and waited. I couldn't have planned it any better. The sorcerer dispelled my magic on the door and several of the traps, while the pixie undid the others. The rogue proceeded through my traps with ease, snuck upon my sleeping body and murdered me with a vicious sneak attack in my sleep. The contingency illusion kicked in, my inanimate clone twitched and coughed and breathed its last breath. They knew I never went anywhere without my spellbook, and when the rogue was paralyzed by the book I had left the sorcerer to cast read magic and confirmed it for arcane script. They clapped themselves on the back and went off to begin to divide up my share. The pixie made judicious use of psionic disintegrate to hide all the evidence in the room, and they considered themselves both more clever than I. My looks of shock and horror, numerous attempts at out-of-character pleading, and some rather heated words with the DM sold the act. The looks on their faces when I teleported into the main hall the next morning were priceless. You know what's a fun class? Incantatrix. The vast number of metamagic feats really give a player a lot to work with. The cooperative metamagic had also really helped the party, as I had chosen evocation as a banned school to further restrict myself and ensure that our sorcerer and pixie, the latter of whom was a kineticist, got to hold the nuke slot on our team. But it really shines when paired with a certain feat, Arcane Thesis. This feat reduces metamagic spell level adjustment by 1, making this like Empower cost plus 1 and Quicken plus 3. At 10th level, an Incantatrix gets an unlisted bonus that does effectively the same thing. They also can add meta magic to spell a few times a day, without increasing its level. This was about to pay massive dividends. Even as the party was recovering from shock, I was casting. I had taken the time to hulk up in my room, prepping with all the usual goodies. Haste, improved mage armor, greater mirror image, blur, really all the goodies. I had almost cast improved invisibility too, but I decided against it, as I also wanted them to bear witness to what their greed had caused. They asked exactly what they were seeing, and the DM turned to me. Throughout the whole campaign, I had been the voice of caution, reason, and moderation. I often backed off from more dangerous activities, citing fear and self-preservation. My response? I look supremely and unshakably confident. These newbies don't know what they've gotten themselves into. Make sure to share your reactions in the comments section. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel All Things D&D. Second part of this story will be posted in three days, so stay tuned for more amazing Dungeons & Dragons content. <laughs>